So, Disney's released the first official look at Hamster and Gretel, and I want to talk about it, because the internet has gone a buzz discussing this show, and there's a good deal to say. But before that, let's recap the past year of Hamster and Gretel production. Earlier this year, we got a sneak peek at the show's theme song, which honestly sounds like a bop. We learned that the family of Gretel and Kevin will be half Venezuelan, half American, inspired by the lives of Dan Pavmeyer and Joanna Hausman, and their family name is Grant Gomez. So the kids are Kevin and Gretel, Grant Gomez. The show has likely already been renewed for season two, as most Disney Channel shows are, so be on the lookout for that announcement soon. Also, the show has apparently tested the best with audiences of any show on Disney Channel since the original Phineas and Ferb. It apparently got the best audience scores in the in the focus tests since the original Phineas. So, uh, wow. so the executives are really excited. We also received the updated logo for the show, which is a magnificent glow up and honestly fantastic. Plus, as a person whose favorite color is dark purple, it makes me happy. And all of this leads us to June 3rd, the first day of Phineas and Ferb summer, and the day we received our first official look at Hamster and Gretel. Before I go into my thoughts further, I need to make a disclaimer. I love the crew working on this show. I know many of them, and I want to make it clear that I have no doubt a lot of love and care was put into this show as a whole. I'm not judging the series by this clip, and it won't determine whether I'll watch the show or not, or enjoy the full first episode. However, this first clip left me with an overall negative impression, and I believe it was a poor choice to release this as the show's first look. Let's jump into it. Basically, this clip is the show's first scene, the cold open, if you will, meaning that right after it ends, we'll probably get the show's theme song. It starts with 16-year-old Kevin fantasizing about his life driving alone on his own adventures, but then juxtaposing it with what's actually happening. He's a chauffeur for his sister Gretel. Their car breaks down, and then aliens come out of the sky to grant them powers, but instead of Kevin and Gretel, it's Hamster and Gretel. So Kevin is upset, and then the cold open ends with a breaking of the fourth wall as Kevin proclaims to the audience, Yep, this is my life. This is my life now. There's a lot to unpack here, so we'll break it down piece by piece. First off, let's talk story and writing. It's surprising to go for a fourth wall break so soon in the show, and it makes me wonder if this is just pilotitis, or if Kevin narrating will be a staple of the show's plot. But more importantly, introducing the powers so soon without getting to know the characters first seems like a weird choice. Like, what else happens in the first episode to justify the receiving powers aspect of the story merely being a footnote? I'm not sure, but the nonchalantness of this whole thing, the way that Gretel and Kevin react so mildly to literal aliens, is weird. I get that this is canonically in the same universe as Phineas and Ferb, so this is a universe where some weird stuff has happened. But I feel like Gretel and Kevin aren't the type of people who regularly see a lot of the Phineas and Milo action, especially if the show is set in a different city to help distance itself from the other two series. As the show's inciting incident, I just feel this falls flat. There's a reason why shows like Amphibia, The Owl House, and The Ghost of Molly McGee give us one or two scenes with the characters to get to know them before things happen, and here, I just don't feel that. There's no definable relationship between the characters to change, making this feel just like, oh, okay, it's happening. This next point might not be an issue for everyone, but having Dan Pavmeyer voice the alien giving them powers in his normal voice feels cheap for an inciting incident. Having heard Dan voice incidental characters for years in Milo Murphy's Law and Phineas and Ferb, the idea that these aliens are just Dan voiced incidentals is worrying. For such a big moment, wouldn't you want to get someone else to voice them? I know he said the line in the elevator pitch, but I didn't think that would make it to the final. The two of you have been chosen to receive superpowers. The two of you have been chosen. Chosen for what? Chosen to be heroes. Wow. Dan has mentioned that the aliens will be a part of the overarching plot a few times, but this is also worrying as it seems like such familiar territory for these writers. Phineas and Ferb had its share of aliens, Milo season two focused on aliens, and Candace Against the Universe had aliens. How will this show's aliens distinguish themselves? As my friend Brian on Twitter comically noted, they've got to stop putting aliens into the stories. No more super, super big doctor, only super, super script doctor. Hearing that Gretel and Kevin's relationship is the heart of the show is surprising as there's just no sense of it here to be built off of. Kevin is frustrated at having to take care of Gretel and Gretel is the model of Libby's child. She's just Phineas repackaged, literally. She's clearly unable to process Kevin's frustration with her much like how Phineas was with Candace. But like I said, this is one scene. Kevin and Gretel are going to be the heart of the show, and I get that the pilot needs to grab your attention immediately. I just wish we knew more of the status quo so we could see how them getting superpowers will affect the status quo. 
Let's move on to the cast. While it hasn't been announced yet, I like the voices here. I bet money that Gretel is voiced by Dan's daughter, Melissa Pavemeyer, which makes sense. There was an enormous cataclysmic event that tore the planet apart that would never happen. Oh, I get it. The two of us. It's surprising to say the least, and I sincerely hope she doesn't get bullied by the internet for this being her first role. You can tell though that there are gonna be some growing pains as some of the line delivery here just feels a bit forced. Superheroes! Hopefully she does get to grow as an actor through this. As for Kevin, I have 100% heard this voice before, but I just can't place it. But he fits very well with Kevin and I like it. Let me know in the comments if you can identify where else you've heard Kevin's voice actor. I, I need to know. Still no clue who's been cast as Hamster since we know he will talk, but I imagine it's a celebrity voice actor. So I'm excited to see who they cast. The animation. All right, folks, full disclosure, I'm not huge on any of the animation here, from the storyboarding to the character designs to the art direction. Let's start with the character designs. I'm honestly shocked that these weren't changed from the initial renders and are basically identical, mostly just because they seem to blend right into the backgrounds with the art direction. Nothing about them really stands out and honestly, I don't think Kevin really passes the silhouette test. He seriously looks like an extra from Milo Murphy's Law. I think Hamster and Gretel's designs will lend themselves well to action scenes, however, which is good, and both of them are definitely unique enough. Going back to the art direction though, it definitely takes the style of Phineas and Ferb and Milo Murphy's Law, which is cool as it'll make the inevitable crossover look nice. And I like this new approach to backgrounds with the trees having a more stylistic design that feels much more art deco than Milo Murphy's Law's grounded approach. I'm still not hot on the color design, but it's passable and it is nice to see a bright cartoon. And if the first scene is anything to go off of, this show is gonna struggle with an overuse of 3D models. We've got the van, of course, and then this alien ship, which really needs anything, anything to help it look more interesting. This has to be the most boring UFO design of the 21st century. The UFO in Milo Murphy's Law's pilot looked leagues better than this, and it wasn't even the focus of the inciting incident. But I sincerely believe none of the CGI in this show can look worse than the Hamasaur from Milo. Well, maybe, we'll wait and see. And then there's the boarding. I know this was boarded by Dan, but my goodness, does everything about this scene just feel lifeless? The angles chosen don't lend themselves to the characters well or are downright flat. There's no pizzazz at all to the revealing powers scene. And this is the actual edit for the grand introduction of Hamster. The boarding does not make this feel like a big moment at all when this should be a huge moment. Everything about the boarding makes this feel so mundane. Part of what makes the cold open of Milo Murphy's Law work as well as it does is the fact that it moves from mundane to chaotic and uses that to present the chaos of Milo's life. There are some shots in that which are so complex that make you forget it's even animated. Or the pilot episode of Phineas and Ferb, where the reveal of the roller coaster is given scale and scope and uses the contrast and boarding for comedy. That's all absent here. Another thing about Milo Murphy's Law's cold open is that the world feels alive and like there's a history and the world is affected by what happens to the characters. Here, there's not a single other car on the road. Mind you, a pretty big road connected to the interstate next to a major city in the middle of the day. The world feels lifeless and empty. Look at the first shot of the Milo pilot. There's water on the side of the road, maybe implying that it rained the night before. Little weeds in the lawn, trees with orange leaves telling you that it's fall. What does the setting of the first scene of Hamster and Gretel tell you? Nothing really. It's by a city that keeps its roads immaculately clean. And let's talk about the elephant in the room, the animation. It's clean and feels more digital than Milo or Phineas. In fact, I'd wager that this is the same studio that was given the first act of Candace Against the Universe, which sucks. They got the line weight right this time, but man, the animation is so stiff. They default to the lifeless stock poses too often, and animation is only used when absolutely necessary. Unless the character is the focus of the scene, they're given the most stiff and boring movements. And why they use Gretel's stock pose so often in this one scene is just baffling to me. It's lifeless. Milo's stock pose was lifeless as well, but at least the show never just left him like that for extended periods of time. This animation just feels so stiff and computer made in a way that Milo and Phineas never really felt. The lines are too clean, too polished, too digitized when compared to the other entries in this world. It just sucks that the worst studio from Candace Against the Universe seems to have made a return. Maybe if we see the episodes done by Synergy Animation or Wong Film, my opinion will change, but for now, I am not optimistic about the show's look. Still, the animation is far from outright bad, but the show's visual presentation and storyboarding in this scene are incredibly subpar. 
I still have significant hope that it'll go uphill, especially if they bring in legend Kyle Menke to do some of the larger action scenes later on this season, and as the animators learn the characters more. Finally, the music. Thus far, the show has no musical identity. I'm sure we'll get there, but I just can't help but compare it again to Milo Murphy's Law, which opened its first episode with the iconic musical sting that would go on to define the show. It still sounded cartoony, but different. In Hamster and Gretel, I can point out another time literally every musical beat in this scene has been used before. It's just the Phineas and Milo scores on remix. Let's listen. Can you fix it? Can you fix it? Can you fix it? No, not really, but I figured... This is awful. What are we supposed to do now? Make a giant waffle. No jokes. Power is unimaginable! <laughs> and was the salvation of all mankind. So Hamster, but if I hold him up like this, he thinks he's running super fast. Look at him go. Go on, go home. Oh, guys. And look, I get it. Writing new music is tough, but this just feels too familiar. If I had to describe this cold open as a whole, it would be derivative. We don't know how powers will affect these characters because we don't know them as characters. The alien is a nondescript Dan Pavemeyer extra in a nondescript UFO, and gives these two characters, who have basically no reaction, incredible powers, and the boarding doesn't support this being a significant event. Hamster's grand entrance is weak, the world feels lifeless, and I just wish that this scene had been presented in a way that felt like it mattered. Maybe the first version of the main theme as they're getting their powers. Maybe a sweeping shot around the characters as they're hit with the ray. Maybe a unique original design for the alien ship just something to latch onto to make me say, oh hey, this is an important scene in the show. And it's just not there. All of these criticisms are things that might be okay later on in the show. A lazy UFO in episode 64? Sure. Reusing music from Phineas and Ferb in 53? Yeah. Damn Pavmeyer voices in every other episode? Why not? It's really just all of these things being in the first three minutes that concerns me. I want to love Hamster and Gretel. I love these writers and this crew, and I know they are capable of great things. No doubt this show will have a fun rogues gallery to meet, some sort of B-plot to unravel like Phineas and Milo, some heartfelt moments, and of course, great original songs. But as a start to this show, this tells me so little about the characters and feels so unimportant that I hope that the rest of the first episode justifies shoving the origin story into the cold open. After all, if it doesn't, I'll be baffled as to how this pilot tested so well with audiences. We'll likely be getting our first look at the theme song with Disney's full announcement at a panel on June 14th at 4.30 p.m., so look forward to more news about the show soon, especially as it's premiering later this summer. I fully plan to continue covering it on the channel, and I want to know what you think, Dimension Hoppers. Did you like the first clip more or less than I did? Do you agree with my points, or did I get something wrong? Leave all your thoughts below, and I'll see you back in Dimension 1.